Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course on Troubleshooting Motherboards. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to go through our requirements from CompTIA A Plus 220 702. And we're going to go through section 1.2, where we need to understand how to install, configure, and maintain personal computer components. Specifically, in this video, we'll talk all about motherboards. First, let's talk about troubleshooting motherboards and what we, sh we should really look for when we're on the, the case to figure out where our problems are really occurring. As with most troubleshooting processes, if you start dividing up the problem, it becomes a much, much easier thing to try to conquer, especially when we've got so many different components on a motherboard. You've got hard drives and DVD-ROMs and a power supply and memory and processors themselves. If you can somehow take certain components out of the equation, it makes it much, much easier to troubleshoot. One way to do this easily is through a manufacturer's diagnostics. Usually a motherboard manufacturer will provide you with a program that can help you troubleshoot different components of the motherboard. If there isn't one from the manufacturer, there are a number of third-party diagnostics you can get. And maybe you should test the hard drive, and then test the memory, and then test other components as well. And you should start narrowing down the things that you know are operating so that then you could start making a list of things that could still be suspect. When you're working with motherboards, you'll also run into situations where the faults may seem to be completely random, especially when you're dealing with issues relating to heat. As a system heats up, the components change. The devices themselves get a little bit hotter. And you may have different types of connectivity when a device is hot versus when it is cold. You also have issues with BIOSes. And sometimes incompatibilities can have random results. Some, sometimes you're working, and suddenly in the middle of doing something, your system halts, and you're not quite sure. Failing hardware can also do this as well. So you can never narrow it down to just one thing. You may have to really go through the process of trying to figure out where this might be occurring and where it might not be occurring. The dividing and conquer really helps you out when you're trying to troubleshoot and find that one thing to resolve. Running diagnostics is really the best way to do this. Because if I can spend all night doing a diagnostics run on a hard drive, and that hard drive comes back clean, I can feel pretty confident that my problem is not with a component of the parts of inside the hard drive. Then let's spend another night doing a test of memory. And if I come back the next day and every part of that memory has passed the test multiple times during the evening, I might feel much, much more secure about the way that memory is working. If you have hardware that you can swap in and out, that may be another option. If you happen to see the memory seems not to be working exactly the way you'd like, and you don't want to run diagnostics all night, take some known memory from a known working machine, put it into your computer, are you still having the problem? That way you can tell if the problem really is a piece of hardware associated with that. Sometimes the components on the motherboard may be causing a problem. I had an old motherboard where a built-in Ethernet port on the motherboard failed. It would not work at all. Windows would not see it. It would not get a link light. It was completely useless to me. And what I did was go into the BIOS inside of my computer and tell the motherboard, just disable that port. Don't even consider that it's there. Don't give me any error messages about it. Pretend it doesn't exist. And we were able to bypass that completely. I added a separate Ethernet adapter card in my motherboard and went about my business. And everything worked perfectly. When you start looking at diagnostics, as I mentioned earlier, often these are provided by the motherboard manufacturer. And usually, if you've got diagnostics, especially those from the manufacturer, it goes a long way for helping you get warranty replacements. Because if you can tell someone on the phone, I ran your diagnostics for an entire night, and it failed multiple times during the night with this particular component on the motherboard, that's the answer. We know at that point, the problem definitely is the motherboard, and they'll be able to get you a swap out. If you're guessing and you sort of think during the normal working day, your spreadsheet crashes, or you're having a problem with your video editing, and you think it's the motherboard, that's not necessarily justification enough. But if you're using the manufacturer's diagnostics, that's what they use. So if you're able to get the same results from their software, that's a really good justification. Sometimes if you don't have manufacturer's diags, Run some third-party diagnostics. UltimateBootCD.com, for instance, can give you a wealth of tests and diagnostics to run of all kinds of different components. Really a great place to go to help give you more insight. Sometimes the manufacturer's diagnostics don't go far enough. Third-party diagnostics can really provide you with a lot more details. 
there are also these great cards you can get that plug into the adapter card slots on a motherboard. And they're called post cards or power on self test cards that can give you feedback about how the system is operating. They look like this. Here's one for a PCI connection, for instance. You plug it in. It has sometimes they'll have ports on them, sometimes they don't, but they almost always will have some type of display that, that gives you a number. And then you can look at the documentation that came with the card and it will tell you what that number means. Here's one, for instance, that's designed for both PCI and the older ISA slots. So you can plug this in. It even has some dummy lights on it to give you information about power and other pieces so that you can get an idea without having a monitor, without having a keyboard or a mouse. You can still get feedback on how you think the power on self test process is really going. Heat is a variable that's very, very difficult to troubleshoot because you're never quite certain just the impact that heat is having on a component. As things heat up, they expand. As they cool down, they contract. And especially if devices heat up and contract enough, you may find that they're creating problems with the components. Maybe they don't have the same connection to the motherboard that they used to have. Sometimes when the computer is hot, it has certain problems. Sometimes when it's cold, there are certain problems. Those are really challenging problems to have to troubleshoot. As this heat gets into systems, especially overheating computers, it greatly shortens the lifetime of these very sensitive electronic components. So we want to be sure that the airflow going through our computer is really, really good. And it's cooling things down exactly the way it should so that we are maintaining and having a longer lifetime for these individual components. If it's not getting cool enough, add some fans. Add some additional heat sinks. Put a fan on top of a heat sink. Do whatever you can to cool down those particular areas of your computer. And this might change over time. You might be running with one hard drive today. Maybe you want to add a new hard drive. That's going to really change the heat that's inside of your computer. And you may need additional fans, or you may need to blow more air of uh, uh, in different places inside of your computer. There's a lot of options available to you aftermarket to add different ways to cool the inside of your computer system. These, for instance, are fans that I put right on top of processors. These are heat sinks. And on top of the heat sink, there's a fan. So you may be able to go to a catalog and say, I want to put a heat sink right on top of another component in my computer. Maybe there's another processor or inside that handles the video. Maybe I want to put a heat sink and a fan right on top of that. What are my options? Many third party options are available to do exactly that. And maybe that's exactly what you need to keep things just a little bit cooler inside of your computer. Other things you can do, especially when you think the BIOS may be an issue with some of this hardware, is to upgrade the BIOS. It stands for Basic Input Output System. And BIOS upgrades is really a good first step. It's after all, the BIOS is really what's really understanding all of the hardware inside of your computer. Check the manufacturer's hard drive uh, website for the, uh, the BIOS. See for the motherboard that they've got an upgraded BIOS for that motherboard. It's a really good first step to make sure you're running the latest version of the BIOS on that computer system, especially especially if you're seeing really weird problems. There's often a, a release notes that you can browse through that says, if you're having this kind of problem, this particular update will fix that problem. Sometimes you can find exactly what you're looking for right there. Take special precautions when you're upgrading the BIOS, though. You're changing the flash BIOS inside of your system. You want to be sure that it completes that entire process without any interruption. So make sure that you're not going to lose power during the middle of this. Don't do it in the middle of a thunderstorm. Don't interrupt it. Don't touch any keys. Don't do, In fact, don't do anything near the system when you're doing a BIOS upgrade. Start the BIOS upgrade and walk away. There, that way, nothing can accidentally fall on the keyboard. Nothing can accidentally fall on the power. It will complete the BIOS upgrade, and you won't be left with a brick at the end of this instead of a computer. You don't want to cause any additional problems that you won't be able to get out of later on. You, you also have a backup plan. Maybe the newest version of the BIOS causes some other kind of problem. Maybe I need to go back to an older version of the BIOS. Make sure you have that older version available if you need to revert back to the previous rev. When you get into dealing with bad components, bypassing those in the BIOS isn't such a bad idea. You can go right into the BIOS configuration and disable the serial port, disable the parallel port, disable the built-in network connection that's on that 
that motherboard. It's a good best practice if you're not uh, really taking advantage of those bad components. You don't want them to cause problems with anything else. Just turn them off completely. That's just a software-based power switch for those components. And now your operating system will never see those bad components inside of your computer. If you have a new device that's coming, make sure you have the new device drivers for it. You're going to need those when you get that particular piece of hardware installed. And if uh, you have a, a, a motherboard with a bad Ethernet card, and like me, you add a new adapter card into that system, you better have the driver for that new adapter card, or you still won't have an Ethernet connection available for yourself. Let's see what we've learned about troubleshooting motherboards. Our first question is, how can you test the motherboard during the startup process. That, of course, is a time when we're really looking at the hardware, which means we're going to need hardware to be able to troubleshoot. And a post-test card, a power-on self-test card, may be the one that you use to be able to do that. Secondly, where is the best place to find motherboard diagnostics? Well, one of the best places you can go is the manufacturer of the motherboard. Sometimes if you don't have that choice, you can find third-party diagnostics. But the very best diagnostics you can get come directly from the manufacturer. And the last question, how can you bypass a bad component, such as an integrated network interface? Well, the best place to go to turn off virtually that interface so that nothing else can see it is to disable it in the BIOS of that motherboard. That covers the information we needed to know to detect problems, troubleshoot, repair, and replace all of these things that might happen on our motherboard. If you'd like to watch any of our other free a videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards or much more, you can visit our website at freeaplus.com.